Hey you guys, this is Josh and Carolyn with Homesteading Family and welcome to this week's episode of the Pantry Chat Food for Thought. This week we're continuing our discussion on off-grid living, different types of off-grid. We're really excited to have Dr. Ramon Issa here today. So we're going to be talking about off-grid medical communities, like getting off the medical grid. So thanks for joining us. Well, thanks for having me. It's an honor to be here. Yeah. Absolutely going to be a lot of fun. <laughs> it is going to be a lot of fun and we've been just talking about off-grid and, and how much deeper off-grid goes than just getting off the power grid right or getting off the water grid and actually there are a lot of other areas that to a lot of us might be more important to get off grid first. Yeah absolutely <laughs> that insert line right here that was my turn and I missed that cue so let's move on to the chit chat. <laughs> So for those of you guys who are new to the pantry chat, we usually do a little bit of chit chat at first and then answer a question of the day. And uh, then we'll move into the main topic. And we have all of that time stamped for you below so that you can move right on ahead if you want. Because sometimes we talk too much. Some, sometimes. Sometimes. <laughs> Although most people replied when you made that comment the other day that they love our talk and they like it that we talk too much because they learn something. So at least, <laughs> at least we say something valuable when we talk too much. So I, that's hope, good. <laughs> I hope so. It is a talking show. <laughs> well, anyway, so what is up with you? What's going on in this snowy, uh, doesn't know if it wants to be 60 degrees or negative 12 degree weather? Yeah, we woke up to negative 12 degrees. What was it at your place? It was negative three. Negative yeah. three. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're a little bit colder, but one way or another, that, that's cold mm -hmm. that is officially cold it is cold uh, we always get some comments from our friends in canada who tell us to buck up a little bit <laughs> that's true and, uh, you know enjoy the sunny balmy day <laughs> absolutely but uh yeah. so i am trying to just wrap up the winter projects you have the projects that you have to get done in the summertime and then you have all the other projects that don't really need warm weather and so i'm trying to get as many of those things done as I can before spring hits and we just get into super busy season. So one of those was I just emptied the freezer of all the lard or all the fat and I rendered it all into mm. lard. So I mm. got 62 and a half quarts of lard rendered Ooh, this weekend. Nice. We did it all in gallons. one day. Yeah, I, th I think I have a video coming out for you guys on that, but that is enough lard to get us hopefully through the entire year, with the addition of good butter in our house for um, for some good fats. Now, but some people that, are going to think that's crazy that we would use that much lard in a year. Right. But it replaces a lot of our butter. Mm. And, it does. And we use it in place of butter, and it is a good, healthy, home-raised lard and fat. Yeah, well, and we don't use cooking oil in our house. Absolutely we not. use butter or we use lard, and then we love our olive oil for salads and for raw applications. So I'm sure... <laughs> and that gets your stamp of approval, yeah, right? Do, do we good it? With okay. the home <laughs> you're nodding my head. I love, I love what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, so right. I've been doing that, and then I finally... You guys watched that video with Melissa K. Norris where we talked about starting onions from seed. We did that video, and she's like, you need to start them right now. Okay, I'll do that. I finally started them from seed. So I might be a few weeks late, but better now, better late, now, than, better late, late than, than never. never. Yeah, I'm not technically late, but I'm not as early as she recommended that yeah, I be to yeah. get big onions. So we do what we can. Anyways, that's what I've been doing. What have you been up to? Well, I just am itching to get into the garden yet. We've still got a foot and a half of snow. So mm -hmm. really just diving into garden planning, actually laying out, you guys, it's important to look at your rotations, lay out where everything's going. So I've actually been mapping that out, talking about what we're doing this year. Are we doing more or less of things? Um, I think we had an abundance of onions. Yeah, we've been in, we're year. always increasing. We finally, in onions, hit a threshold. We went over the threshold, onions, which is cool. Onions, garlic, and shallots. We are. Yeah. We made enough. Did enough. Yeah. So really, just making plans for that, diving into a few things that we want to grow better, like some of the brassicas, broccoli, mm -hmm. particularly. We want more. Um, more veggies for the winter since we can't eat fresh besides green beans. We always have a lot of green beans. Yeah. We get a little burnt out on green beans and we love the broccoli and the cabbage. So looking at increasing our soil geared toward that a little bit. 
and just kind of planning because I'm, I'm itching to get out there. I walk by the garden every day and, and uh, I'm just waiting. It's and, time. Kind of the sunny weather I, gets that gets that going, you know, you get to this place where you're just like, come on, let's go. Let's get out there. I don't want to sidetrack us too far because I know we're all really excited to get into the main conversation. But the being able to focus on the brassicas, this world has really opened us up to us because of the freeze dryer. Mm. Because right now, the best way to store your brassicas, like your broccoli, is in the freezer. But that just takes up way too much freezer space for us. Mm. We usually keep our freezer space for things like meat, our home-raised meat. Mm. And so this has just been hard to have that much stored broccoli. But the freeze-dried broccoli is amazing. It works out so well. So this kind of now opens up that door. Well, it stores longer with less yeah. energy. You're not using the freezer, so you're, you know, saving that that energy use. It's a one-time preservation and um, it also lasts longer. Yeah. It does deteriorate in the freezer and then um, I think that it maintains the nutrition even a little bit better. Yes, it's yeah. supposed to. Cool. Yeah. So, what about you, Doc? What are you, what are you up to? You're, you're you've got a homestead here up the road. Sure. And uh, what's going on with you? Well, we're just trying to keep the place warm and the ice dam ice dams off of the roof. We yeah. had a, a bunch of ice dams build up. And so we uh, we got that chopped down and we put a little bit of heat tape on there. So hopefully mm -hmm. next year we won't oh, have good. that same problem. And uh, we're trying to keep the chickens from freezing to death and <laughs> making sure their water is uh, you know, there oh, yeah. and, and stuff like that. So we've been, we've been keeping busy. Do you use a heater for their water yeah. or do you just manually go out with hot water? Uh, both. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we have a hot plate that the metal uh, waterer sits on. Mm -hmm. And so, but we have to bring the water out there and make sure it's, uh, it's plugged in. And so I was in the barn last night and uh, I had a little surprise. There was a little deer that has, I guess, start, started living. I, we've been seeing little, uh, little uh, prints, little deer prints outside of the, well, one of the, the man doors, you know. And I was like, oh, what's going on? Well, last night, I, the kids left the, the barn light on. And so I was like, oh, my goodness, it's like negative whatever. And I'm already getting ready for bed. But I'm like, I, it was bugging me. So I went out there. And there was a little deer. And it was not afraid of us. So I think we've been accidentally feeding it when we're feeding the horses and, no, and other yeah. things. Oh, yeah. I walked, adopted you. Oh, I walked within maybe 10 feet of it. And it just, it never got up. It was sitting on a little pile of hay for, oh. uh, for the horses. A little warm spot, comfy, it was, it was plenty like, of yeah, feed. I'm good. I don't yeah, know free, free, free ride. He goes, he's probably thinking, you're not usually in here. This is my place right now. <laughs> you know, he goes, I'm never in there at, uh, at, that late at night. Wow. Oh, that's fun. Oh, that's yeah, cool. Well, that the, the special uh, joys and challenges of this time of year. And now we're going to transition slowly. Hopefully this will be one of the last cold snaps. This is a really cold snap for us. But now we get to move into mud season, which is a whole mm. different set of challenges. Mm -hmm. Icy mm -hmm. mud. <laughs> yep. So that is, that is life on the homestead, but it is good. It is good. Yep. yep. Well, hey, we got a lot to cover. So yeah. shall we move on, take care of a question here? And this question is from AJ Harker on uh, the fermenting vessel post. And uh, let's see. Hello from snowy Scotland. Right on, AJ. Well, thanks for reaching out to us from Scotland. Um, we absolutely love your podcast. They keep us sane through lockdown. I understand that. And, and now I have my first question for you. I've been using your continuous batch kombucha method. And I've got three liter large glass vessels with taps at the base. I'm sorry, I just have to succumb to using these things. Um, <laughs> and I use them to make a large batch, which I bottle, adding flavors of the bottles for their second ferment. The method works perfectly, thank you, and is so much easier than the hundreds of glass jars I was using previously. Wow. Mm -hmm. But I do... Um, but I do now have a problem. The taps at the base of the large vessels are now blocked. I think from the gunk, which hangs around in the base of the vessel, so I now have to empty them from the top of the jar, which is tricky. How do you keep your taps free flowing and how often do you recommend fully emptying and cleaning the vessel? Yeah, that, that's a very real problem. Those, um, you know, you get those big water jugs, the big two and a half gallon like water jugs with the little spigot dispensers. And those work really well for the continuous brew method for kombucha, but it's got stuff in it. <laughs> you know, it's got the mother and it gets kind of stringy and gunky. So it does clog up the spigot. So usually about twice a year, I have to empty the whole thing out. I just drain it off into jars and I take it apart and have to do a complete cleaning on it. You can get replacement spigots. Um, I have heard people say that theirs have gotten so bad that they've actually just replaced it. Uh, but I haven't had to do that yet. I can usually really get in there and scrub it. The, the 
oddest tool that I have found that has really been helpful for this is you know when you get the little nutcracker sets, they have the little pick that come, mm -hmm. you got the little mm -hmm. hand cracker, right, and then little, those little, little teeny, pick it's for like picking the walnuts yeah, out. Yeah, it's the, almost the like a little yeah. toothpick or mm -hmm. something that's metal. I use that thing. I did go see, I don't even use them for getting nuts out of the <laughs> shell, but I use them for cleaning out my spigot in the kombucha, mm -hmm. you know, jug. And that has worked really well. But it's about two times a year. Make sure about once a quarter, once every three months, you're checking the size of your kombucha mother because if it's happy, it will multiply really quickly and you'll end up with really quickly fermenting kombucha um, because there's so much mother ratio to the rest of it. And it so does get a little strong. It does it start to get a little fast. strong yeah. and it doesn't give you as much you know, volume for the actual kombucha in because there's so much mother. So take that off, make kombucha gummies or give it to a friend or do something with it. So, right, kombucha yeah. gummies. Kombucha gummies, mm. yeah. I didn't know they were healthy. I, you know, generally they involve way too much sugar to call <laughs> anything healthy, so. <laughs> I, but I the, the kids, if it's squishy yeah. and got sugar in it, yeah, you know, they're going to find something they, to do They with do, it. they pretty much yeah. taste like a gummy bear if you do it right, so wow, that works cool. out for us. Right, yeah. I've been missing out. There you go. Yeah. Okay, we're ready to dive into the main topic of the day, which is off the off-grid medical system now if you guys joined us a couple of weeks ago months ago uh, it's yeah we've been rotating between off-grid and gardens but josh and i were talking about the different types of off-grid systems there are we we tend to think of the grid as being the electrical mm -hmm. grid and that if you're off-grid you just have solar panels and you've detached from the main electrical grid but we've been talking about how there are actually a lot of different grids um, and a lot of them that really need to be looked at right now in history to see if we should be kind of distancing ourselves from them. And the medical grid is one that came up and a lot of you guys got really interested in that and wanted us to talk a little bit more about the medical grid. And, you know, that is not our expertise, but we know somebody whose it is their expertise. So we happen to have Dr. Issa here. He has started a practice called the Off Grid Doc. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so let's talk about what is the medical grid mm -hmm. and what, like, if we're talking about getting off grid, mm -hmm. What does that mean for the medical grid? Okay, um, so what you're touching on is, is something that's very uh, um, exciting right now in the field of, of medicine. And uh, what we've done is, it's called, the, the model that we're using is called direct primary care. And it is a membership-based medical practice instead of the insurance-based uh, medical practice. And the reason why that's so important, so as a physician, I took my practice off-grid um, to be able to do what I believe is practice medicine in the way that I believe is best interest for the patients, as opposed to a lot of what happens in a doctor's office if you're on the grid insurance-based model is you're, you're jumping through a lot of hoops and you're, there's a lot of red tape and there's a lot of um, things that you're so worried about getting paid and insurance approving this and that and auditing this and that that you forget that you are there primarily for the patient and their health. And I wanted as um, minimal amount of inter uh, interference or restriction or red tape between the doctor and the patient. It's kind of new, but it's kind of old. <laughs> so like, so, so going off grid allows you to view your patient without a lot of the other lenses that are in between mm -hmm. through the insurance and the different systems that are there, right? Yeah. That, that a lot of doctors have to make considerations as they're looking at the patient. Mm -hmm. And that, I mean, in our view, mm -hmm. at least Caroline's muddies the water yep. and you're not always getting that direct care and that direct attention where you're talking about just being able to do, deal right with your, your patient exactly. and not have some of these other things that you've got going on in the back of your head or systems you have to work in. That's right. So I think it's so exciting that something like that's been so disruptive mm -hmm. like COVID mm -hmm. is actually really kind of exploded this because I think it's yeah. come really to the forefront of all of our mm -hmm. knowledge how much the medical industry is dealing with exactly that. Like that's right. this is not just let's do what's best for the patient. Mm -hmm. It's what's, you know, what the insurance is going to pay for right. and what's pushed and what the legalities are right. like all these different things mm -hmm. so 
what are the different elements as you have the off-grid practice? I mean, you're able to step away from the insurance, mm -hmm. but how are there other ways that that affects your relationship with the patients? Oh, sure. So the, the, main, uh, the main thing that really affects the, the relationship with the patient is once you're not on the insurance-based model of practicing medicine, and whether that's the government form of the insurance-based model or private or commercial pay or whatever it is, that model is, is set up in a way that you just can't spend the amount of time that is needed to be, you know, to, to get to, if you're interested in addressing someone's problem, a patient's s symptom and getting to the root of the problem, it's, you can't do it in a 15 minute office appointment. But the whole system of the insurance-based model, the way you get reimbursed, it, you have to design your practice around 15-minute office visits, and then you have to pay a lot of money to people, billers and coders, to make sure you're writing the right words down for each visit, and you're spending a lot of time just trying to get paid for what you're doing, as opposed to figuring out, taking the time that you need to figure out what is the patient's problem, what are their symptoms, what's their lifestyle, how do they eat, when do they eat, and figuring out what the root of the problem is, as opposed to, that's why I think it, we doctors we ended up when I, I did the on-grid medical practice for family medicine um, almost 20 years ago and um, you find yourself to, to, to meet that time crunch and to get paid and to document and put all the right codes um, playing the games with insurance uh, you, you're constantly trying to figure out how to end the doctor patient visit as soon as you get in the room and you say, hello, how are you doing, Dr. Issa, yeah. you know, whatever, I'm trying to think, how am I going to close this? Because I only have 15 minutes. And, and writing a prescription for a, for a symptom is a very fast, easy way mm -hmm. to end a, a, it's artificially ending a patient-doctor visit. And with this model, you're not under those time constraints. Uh, insurance companies, I don't know if people realize this, but insurance companies, no, no matter where it is, whether it's uh, you know the government-based insurance or, or commercial, they audit your doctor's charts to see what diagnosis codes are there. And if there's somebody that has obesity or high blood pressure or diabetes, they want those patients on certain prescriptions. They want to see that they're being given those prescriptions. Or me as the doctor will get uh, demerit will get ranked lower as a good we're not as a good of a physician uh, you, wow. you might get reimbursed less for patients if they're not on prescription medications to match those diagnoses codes so your choices are limited even as a doctor in what you can do for the patient in that system in the time constraints and if you want to make the most uh, uh, you want to get paid the most from the insurance companies you've got to do these certain things and so that not not that you won't do the right thing as a doctor you mm -hmm. want to but the the pressures and the everything's kind of lined up for people to be on medications forever and for you know just instead of tr trying to figure out what's going on so so i think this is this isn't to say there aren't a lot of doctors out there trying to do the best they oh, can for their patients yeah. but that there is a system there the normal system that we're all used to mm -hmm. that inherently kind of gets in the way it does. And well, so you're sorry go ahead but I was say so you're pioneering really a new system and and that's one of the exciting things about these last few years while these these been these dark clouds all around us there's often as uh, this is a great thing about the human mind and spirit is we find a new place to go we find a new solution and so now emerging yes. is this this new concept that's and right. model for medicine mm -hmm. yeah I was gonna say that this what you're <laughs> describing in medicine that that's gonna be really soul deadening you know, for the doctors to have to play this game. They're there to actually help the patients and then they can't yes. because they've got to play this game. They are literally working for the insurance companies now yeah, and not for the patient. And, you know, historically that's not the case. Before mm -hmm. the insurance companies, you had, you were working with the actual patient. That's right. And so I love that what you're doing, it's just taking out that whole thing and it's like, hey, let's sit down and let's talk again yep. and let's spend the time that we need. Yep. I think that's really exciting. Exactly. So can you cue us, you were talking off camera about the two types of off-grid. Mm. That's maybe a great direction yeah. to go about the, our personal experience mm -hmm. medically off-grid okay. and then our interaction, I think, with you was the other one or however you would say that. Sure. That, yeah, how I look at it, like you're mentioning, there's different, you know, with your house, there's different ways of being off grid. You know, it's not just electrical, but off grid is a mindset. It is being self sufficient. It's being um, a troubleshooter. It's being taking your own. There's two ways that I look at it in med medically, and that is as a doctor, I took my practice off grid, so I'm not uh, dependent on these, you know, these, uh, you know, 
pressures from insurance companies to do certain things that are artificially really, and it's not the primary goal wasn't to help the patient. So as a physician, as a practitioner, or a provider, as a healthcare provider, you can take your practice off grid. It's I, my practice is independent of you know insurance company, and I answer to the patient. You know they're the, they're the one in charge. And then there's the op, there's the other side of me, which um, I'm a patient as well. I'm a human. I want I have my own health, and not just I'm a practice and you know practitioner, um, but I want my patients and I want to inspire and empower people to take their own health, look at themselves as off-grid, and I don't have to rely on the doctor's office, this medical model of sick care, every month, every month, or every week, or whatever it is, uh, uh, anything happens, and then it's, I'm in the office and I'm getting a prescription. You, you need to disconnect from that system. Mm -hmm. It's broken, and just look at yourself as you're in charge your, of your health, and you should be as independent and self-sufficient uh, as possible. So take your health off grid instead of every month getting a prescription for your chronic medications. If there's something you can do different in your diet and lifestyle to get off that medicine, do it. And then you're unplugged from that system. So just thinking differently. Well, and, but people to, to know that they can do something differently need a voice like yours to help them see how there is a different path. There are different solutions because you're not getting it in the main model. And so that's where it just gets really exciting. That's correct. Is that, hey, you, you can help people see, you know what, actually there is a different way to treat this this ailment, this symptom, whatever's, mm -hmm. whatever's going on that you're dealing with. So I love this because most of you guys as homesteaders are really familiar with this idea, although I've never heard it said in this kind of term, like taking your health off grid. You guys are really familiar with that. A lot of people come to us and tell us that the reason they're homesteading is because of health, because mm -hmm. they've had a health crisis and they had to change their diet. And then mm -hmm. they started looking at the food and they started changing their diet even more. And then they wanted to grow their food. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like this is a very homestead message right mm -hmm. there. But the lack in that is most of you guys know as a homesteader, you're doing all these things and trying to eat these healthy ways. And then you have a crisis and you go to a regular mm -hmm. on-grid doctor mm -hmm. and they look at you like you're crazy. Like <laughs> I remember telling somebody that I used, um, I think one of the kids' doctors, that I put garlic in their ear for an ear infection and they said, Oh, you're going to cause all sorts of problems. <laughs> like they thought they were going to, you know, have skin problems from the garlic. Just no idea yeah. of the different things that could be done. Mm -hmm. And so this is really exciting because it can augment mm -hmm. what we're already doing. Yep. The things, the steps that you're already taking instead of having to fight against it to that's get a, real answers. That, that's exactly what my, I'm passionate about is because I'm trained in the medical system and went to medical school and the traditional practice, um, I'm very good at figuring out how to first do no harm uh, because I know where the harm comes from with the prescription medications and with surgeries. Things that, for example, just because uh, a surgery is approved by your insurance doesn't mean it's indicated or it's the best thing for you. Yeah. Just because a doctor can get paid to do a surgery, it just means the insurance checked a bunch of boxes. But is there another way? Is there an alternative? Is it the best thing for me? Um, you know, that's the question you should ask. But yeah, taking your health off grid, uh, I want people to figure out and realize, I didn't know as a doctor five years ago, because I, well, I was morbidly obese and I had a severe hypertension and I had severe heartburn. I was on all these medications and arthritis and sleep apnea. And I thought, I mean, I was miserable and I was already a physician. I was already a family practice doctor. It wasn't like I didn't know or I didn't have like willpower. I got through medical school and 20, you know, 16,000 hours of training. I have no willpower. That's how I got, no, but right. You didn't know, I didn't know how to connect the dots mm. and I did not know what was possible. I did, know, did not know it was possible to eat differently and reverse high blood pressure. I didn't know it was possible to eat differently and let your body reverse the uh, diabetes or morbid obesity. I was over 308 pounds um, and I just ate differently and I put the connected the dots together and I was like, because my wife would be like, hey, you know, you should go see your doctor, you're snoring, you're pain, your heartburn, taking pills, blood pressure, palpitations. And, and I was like, no, I'm not going to go see them because that's me. I know what they're trained to. It's not, <laughs> they're I'm not, not helping. No, it's not helping. No, I said no one ever gets better when they see me for these chronic diet and lifestyle problems. I said, whatever it is, the answer is not in the doctor's office because that's where I live and work. And no one gets better. No one gets off their medications or stops having these you know, problems. We can mask and cover the symptoms of something that's wrong. So that, that caused me to evaluate. I, got, I was on grid and I was sick. 
-hmm. And then when I said, there's got to be a better way, my body's not designed to be sick. It wants to be healthy. If I just give it what it needs mm -hmm. and avoid things that are harmful, I bet you my body will go back to how it was mm -hmm. because I wasn't morbidly obese, hypertensive, pre-diabetic, fatty liver, metabolic syndrome when I was born. And I wasn't that way even 10 years before that as an adult. I was an athlete and I was healthy. Something had happened. Mm -hmm. And to know, you touched on something that's, that's my passion. The other doctors don't know what's possible. And guess what? If your doctor doesn't know something is possible or doesn't believe it's possible, he's right. It won't be possible right. because they won't try. You won't try something you don't think is possible. Anyway, yeah, so yeah you've got to have some, that knowledge and you've got to yep. have that belief. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's exciting because that's part of the homesteading off-grid spirit is thinking through things, is looking exactly. for new solutions. Yep and finding a way to overcome exactly. the challenge. And so you've done that and now you're helping other people. So can you, can you give us a, a little bit of how this works and, and you know, how, to, how does it work for you and your practice engaging a patient? And then maybe we'll talk a little bit about how people can maybe find solutions. Sure, so for the, the medical practice? Mm -hmm. Sure. Like, so what, what it's called, what you're looking for, if you want to be able to find a doctor that can really speak truth to you, that can spend the time that you need to, that's not jumping through hoops for insurance, trying to get paid. It's called a direct primary care model, DPC, direct primary care. And that is that model that we're, that we're following that allows us to do what we're, we're talking. So that's what you'd be looking for is a direct primary care or DPC of, you know, um, membership based. There's concierge. There's a, there's a lot of different words for it, but that's the key words that you'd be looking for. And it's not that you can't have it. I have plenty of patients that have insurance. You can have insurance, and a lot of them do, and they still find it valuable to have a doctor that's off-grid. They'll add my services and my, uh, you know, expertise, my and what I bring to their insurance, you know, practice model because they're, you know, whether their job pays for it, you know, it's provided to them for, from whatever. They may have that uh, insurance model, but they want access to you know, something where we can spend more time with people, get to the root of the problem and get it, you know, direct and straight and get better. So, so that leads into another part of the discussion for people, because a lot of people are in the model. It's the model that they have. It's the model that works for them, the insurance model. And so thinking of stepping out of it, even when you want to, is challenging. So what, what do you see people doing that, that want the solution that you have and that more doctors are starting to provide? How do you, you know, how do you see them dealing with it since you don't take insurance, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. so, so what are you seeing there, um, how people are using this? Sure, so what people are doing is they're adding my services as a membership to my practice to, to get my expertise, my experience, and, and my angle on health and, and medicine to their uh, they, they may have a like a, a commercial based insurance product or catastrophic insurance product. So for big hospitalizations, mm -hmm. surgeries, accidents, illnesses, if you had to go to the emergency room or be hospitalized, you've got some coverage for the big stuff. Um, also, a lot of patients of mine will have a, a cooperative insurance uh, you know, plan, uh, which is, uh, it's, I mean, it's a little bit different mm -hmm. it's, than the traditional standard practice, but it, it complements to what I'm doing. Okay, so that would be like the medical sharing programs that they have out there. Josh and I actually, that's what we mm -hmm. use for insurance. And I know that this is um, available to the Christian community. I don't know if there are non-Christian programs out there, non-faith-based. But... I think there are. I don't know of one. MediShare is a large one. We've used that now mm -hmm. for, for nearly 20 years. Um, Samaritan is another one that's mm -hmm. great. Those are definitely Christian sharing. I know there's one other Christian sharing. The, more of this is going to pop up as opportunities yes. are coming. And it's, it's another form of, of off-grid because it, it mm -hmm. works like insurance to varying degrees, but it's not the insurance model. And you got to look at them. Some of them work a little more like insurance. Some of them you have a little more freedom mm -hmm. in how the payments are. But they're a great alternative, especially if moving in this direction for your health care is something that's interesting to you. Besides that you're helping the Christian community as well, Absolutely. sharing the burden. Mm -hmm. So one thing that you've said a couple times is membership, mm -hmm. that you've got a kind of a membership model here. So what does that look like mm -hmm. for a patient? Because that's very different than what we're used to sure. medically. Yeah, exactly. So uh, um, in my practice, uh, it's a, you know, these direct primary care mem membership based practices, um, they're a lot smaller than the typical insurance based practice. When I had a practice uh, based on insurance and you have to see, you know, patient every 10 or 15 minutes, I, I probably had close to 
2,500 patients. Okay. A couple thousand wow, patients. Wow, how do you get to know them? You and, don't and, know. Right. It's very them difficult. Out. Yeah, with two to 3,000 patients, it's very difficult. And so this type of a practice, the membership-based, it's smaller. It's like a, it's like a family. Uh, some doctor, you, you, you may have three or four hundred patients as opposed to 3,000 patients. So you can see how that all, the, all of a sudden it changes the, the, the tone, the yeah. mood, and what have you. So we can bill patients monthly or you can bill uh, yearly. Uh, but we interview each other. We have a meet and greet to get to know each other. Uh, because like I said, it is a very, you, you get my cell phone, you get my email, we text, we call. It's just like you've now joined. It, it'd be how I would take care of my family uh, if they got sick or had any questions that come up in your health. So we can come um, knock on your door at 11 o'clock at night? Well, I mean, I'd, <laughs> I'd give me a little heads up. As, as far as I know, you know. You are down the road, I mean, you know. You <laughs> could. <laughs> There's a lot of things. But it's a, it's a tight-knit community. Yeah. And we have, like, direct access 24-7. And you know who that person's going to be that you call. It's not going to be an on-call center, a random doctor covering for someone else. It's So it's very tight-knit. And, you know, we have a, it's a different style of practice. And you, you it, I'm looking for patients and the doctor's that do direct primary care, they're looking for patients that have that off-grid mentality of, mm. I want to learn things, empower me. What do I do? Why does this work? How can I stay healthy? How, I want to teach people how to not need the MD. I want to yeah. teach people how to not need me. Mm. You know, And so what you guys are talking about, this is that's huge. And, that, and that's why it's membership-based. It's very close-knit family and community. And I want to make sure patients know this is what they're getting. I'm going to be trying to troubleshoot and problem solve like an off-grid person mm -hmm. rather than throw a prescription drug at every symptom and not think about it. Yeah, so it's different. Not wow. everybody likes that. This sounds like medical freedom to me. <laughs> uh, it does. Yeah, I like it, it. Does We're all about much. health freedom and security here. So. All right. So, okay, you kind of teased us a little bit with your story, your personal mm -hmm. story, and how you were having kind of a health crisis yourself, mm -hmm. even as a doctor. So can you just in like a couple of quick sentences sum up what was the journey like going from that to where you are now? Oh, um, health, health wise, health wise, or yeah. doctor wise, uh, health wise, health wise. Yeah. Uh, like where I where I was, I was obese. Uh, I, I hurt every day, aches and pains, a heartburn, moody, irritable, um, hungry all the time, cravings, high high blood pressure. I was supposed to be on high blood pressure, supposed to be on blood pressure medicine, supposed to be on whatever heartburn medicine. But I didn't want to take drugs every day for the rest of my life. You know, I was I was young, uh, but. Um, so I did a few things with my diet and my lifestyle, and actually it was the, the, the why, the, what changed in my spirit was I was taking care of my dad that had a stroke a, f a few years before at, at home, and I was taking care of him, injecting him with mm. insulin and, and medications for diabetes. He was having strokes and heart attacks, and he passed away, and I, and I watched him die as a result, end result of the things that I was beginning to have. Yeah. And so that mm. was, I said, wow. I got to do something different, and that's when I came and I had a you know a paradigm shift where I like you said mm -hmm. off grid style. I said, what's going on here? Why did I get sick? And what can I do? And then you know and, and then got on. and then got on it. And I was like, let's do it. Let's go. Wow, very cool. That is really um, neat. We're running. We're getting run on short on time, and I want to cover one more thing, yeah. and that is, do people have to be local? to engage you or doctors like what you're doing? What does that look like? Does it need to be, I mean, obviously it's probably best if it's local and we can meet face to face, but is that the only alternative? We've got people watching that are all over the country, mm. all over the world, even as we saw Scotland. Mm. Um, so what, what are options there for people that are like, wow, I, this, is, this is exciting to me, this is interesting. Sure, um, sure it's not limited to local. It's, it's nice. If you can be local or within driving distance, because if something comes up where you need to meet in person, uh, do a physical exam or do a procedure like we do, um, you know, excision, a biopsy or, you know, something like that. It's nice to have a local doc. But if it's just taking your health off grid, learning how to eat and live in a, in a healthy way, um, it, you can do it remotely. You can do this by video. We do plenty of video visits. Um, and it depends if you're not practicing medicine, i.e. prescribing a drug or ordering a lab test or an imaging study or anything like that, then you can cross state lines without having to have a license in that state. Okay. So that's how it is. Um, um, so I know there are physicians. Um, so anywhere uh, that they're licensed, they could do a video visit and practice medicine if they needed to prescribe medications or order labs and tests and diagnose, uh, they could out of state. It just depends on where they're licensed at. Um, if they're doing just health coaching, 
and they're not prescribing, but you're using, you're keeping your primary care doctor and using this, you know, uh, physician as a coach that knows the okay. medicine model and they, they can help you eat and live differently. And they can say, hey, ask your doctor, you know, we'll work together. They can order and prescribe and reduce your medications as you're eating differently and living differently. They can do it all over the country. Wow. That's Very exciting. exciting. That's, awesome. That's really neat. Okay, yeah. cool. Where can people get a hold of you if they want to reach out and talk to you directly? Okay, well, uh, I'd like people to go to my website, offgriddoc.com. Okay. I like your website. Thank, that, that, oh, that's thank a you. cool website, I gotta <laughs> thank say. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. My cousin made it for me. He, All right. Yeah, he's, he's supportive, <laughs> like you said, he's supportive of what we're doing and yeah. bringing healthcare in, in a good way, in free, you know, in a freedom type way for patients to get healthy. And then if they want to email us at office at offgriddoc.com. So office Perfect. at offgriddoc.com is a great way to connect with us. Great. Or you can go to the website offgriddoc.com and then check it out and see if this is something that you're interested in. That cool. is really exciting. And, you know, look around in your area, too, and see if you have somebody doing this kind of medical practice, bringing this up. This is something we all want to support and kind of get on the bandwagon to give, let's add some fuel to this mm -hmm. fire, because mm -hmm. I think this is really exciting, and this is exactly what the medical community needs right and now. And it, it is what our human community needs. Mm -hmm. It's what it we as people mm -hmm. need to have some additional options to the medical system, mm -hmm. um, you know, to, to help things along. So. Thank you so much for joining oh. us. This has been a great conversation. You guys get the conversation going down in the comments. If you have questions, anything like that, let's let's really just spark this conversation and get this fueled and going because we want this to happen everywhere so everyone has access to this kind of health care. Absolutely. It's been hanging with you guys. Good hanging with you guys. <laughs> and we will see you soon. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs>